Amen. Well, I'll just pray for Sarah before she comes up. Lord, we just thank you for Sarah tonight. Father, I pray that you would loosen her lips to speak the words that you would have her to speak tonight. Father, I pray tonight that every word that is spoken is from your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that not only will you give her clarity to speak tonight, but Father, I pray that you give clarity for all of us to receive tonight as well. And so, Lord, I thank you for all that you're going to do, Lord. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Would you welcome Sarah up to the stage? She gets a hug every week. You get a hug again. (laughs) Every day, hugs. Lucky me. (laughs) So how is everybody tonight? Good? Did you all have a good week? I've been enjoying the sunshine. I don't know about you. No (laughs) chemtrails. So it's been good. That's always a good thing. (laughs) Get some sun. Um, Okay, so just like Sean said, tonight is session four of our Revelation and End Time study. And just a quick, uh, few quick reminders again, um, if you weren't here or if you haven't seen the videos from the previous sessions, I want to encourage you to go do that because they're really kind of important <laughs> to know that information from those sessions to, as we're going through. So please go do that. And again, the, quest- the, uh, the notes are on the link. Apparently our YouTube channel got flagged this week. <laughs> But it wasn't my message, it was Sean's message. (laughs) It was your message, Jason told me. (laughs) Yeah. So, he was talking about the you-know-what last Sunday. And I think that's what happened. Anyway, so, yeah, no. So anyway, the link was not working because of that. And so, uh, like, to the link to the notes. So I think Jason fixed it, hopefully. But either way, um, if you just need me to send the notes to you through email so you can print them off or whatever, just please notify me and I can do that for you, okay? Um, the other thing is that we will have questions again at the end of the session. Last week there were no questions, which is interesting. But anyway, um, and so I did have some people, actually quite a few people, come up to me after the session and they were like, I, have, I feel like I have a dumb question. <laughs> and so that's why Sean was mentioning that. There are no dumb questions. This is all stuff that can be very difficult to understand. And like Sean said, I'm sure a lot of other people have been wondering the same thing, maybe. So um, there are no dumb questions. P- please feel confident to ask your questions, okay? And I will do the best, uh, to the best of my ability, answer them. I can't promise I will be able to answer them fully, but I will do the best I can, okay? So having said all that, um, I wanted to do a quick review of last week just because I know there was a lot of information (laughs) and there was a lot of history and not everybody is big into history. For those who like history, it probably was really awesome and exciting. For those who don't like history, it probably was a little overwhelming. (laughs) So, I wanted to just go through this like just quickly one more time because again if we leave out certain parts of the Bible because they're difficult to understand or go through then we're leaving out a big portion of the Bible right and that's not good and that's serious so um, God put this information in there for a reason right and so it must be important Um, so I want to encourage you if you have a hard time going through this push through it Don't just say, oh, it's too hard to understand. I'm not going to bother. Push through it because I promise you that the more you read it, the more you study it, the more you will understand it. So it's kind of like, have any of you ever watched a movie and then you went and watched it a second time and the second time you saw a lot more or you noticed a lot more than you did the first time? And then maybe you went and watched it a third time and you noticed even more? (laughs) This is kind of the same with Bible prophecy. And with any, any part of the Bible, actually. And so um, just keep pushing through and, and don't give up, okay? Don't give up on it. And again, I'm always, always willing to answer any questions you guys have. Um, 
Okay, and I'm, I totally went ahead of myself there, and I've lost my place in my notes, but um, we will continually be learning and understanding all the way up until Jesus comes back. Um, so even though we will never fully understand everything, um, we certainly, certainly can get a much better understanding. And we're, even if we just read it, we're blessed. So even if you're just doing that, that's awesome, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so let's do a really quick review of last week. We went through Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 8, because we're focusing on the prophetic chapters of the book of, of Daniel. And in both those chapters, both King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel had dreams. Uh, both of them were quite a few years apart, these dreams that they had. But the, though the dreams were giving, given differently, they were given differently, they, the interpretation was the exact same. And so, uh, in short, these dreams were about four kingdoms that were going to arise, and then the end would come. And these kingdoms are Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, and then in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel has another dream that gives even more information about two of those kingdoms, the Persia and the Greek kingdoms. Um, now, you might be wondering why it was so important to learn all of that, because a lot of it is history, for us anyway, it was its history. We can look back. What does it have to do with the end times? It has a lot to do with the end times. Um, those dreams weren't just given to Daniel, they were given to us, as well. they were for us, they were for our benefit. Um, Daniel only saw the fulfillment of uh, so he, when he got the dream, there was Babylon, who was the first empire, but then he lived only to see the fulfillment of the, Pers the Medo-Persia empire. And so clearly these dreams weren't just for their benefit, it was for anyone in the future. Um, and the whole purpose is so that the people in the future could be prepared for what's to come, right? And so um, it was also for the Jews living at the, at the time and onwards, they would know by those prophecies that there was more empires to come. And we saw that happen as we went through the history of all of that. Um, but it's more than just knowing the history, it's seeing the prophecies fulfilled and how they were fulfilled and it, and it gives uh, us a complete accurate picture of these prophecies from the Bible as we look back over history and we can see how true the word of God is, but um, again, it's so that we can be prepared. That's the whole point of all it, right? And so people who don't take a look at these things, it's really sad because there's a lot of Christians nowadays that think we're just kind of in a blip in history right now. And there's like another 10,000 plus years before Jesus comes back and all this kind of stuff. But the reason why this is also important, and this is the whole point, I'm saying a lot of words to get to this point, is um, that it is very clear in Daniel that there will be four kingdoms and then the end will come. And we saw all four of these kingdoms fulfilled, right? And so the last part is the, or the very final kingdom is still part of the Roman Empire. It is a revived Roman Empire that will be the final world kingdom. And so if, um, you know, and by studying the Bible, we can see that there's been, you know, about 6,000 years since creation. And in Daniel, we're told that there's the four major kingdoms. And we saw those kingdoms fulfilled. Um, and because the final world power that will lead the, that will be led by the Antichrist is the revived Roman Empire, we can know that there will be no more empires, right? They're, they're, this is it. If there's 10,000 plus years, you would probably see quite a few more empires pop up. And, and these empires have everything to do with Daniel. So when you, some people might be saying, oh, what about America and what about Great Britain and all that, or the British Empire and all that. These prophecies in Daniel are regarding Israel. So these are the, this is the God's time clock that we're seeing, right? The, the empires are on God's time clock till the end when Jesus comes back. So these are empires that basically controlled the region that Israel is in up until the end, okay? So I got us out of myself again. But again, if there's 10,000 plus years, that's, that's just not 
going to happen. <laughs> it's just not. There would be a lot more empires, and we can know by studying this that we are right there, right? Um, and if we're not aware of this, we won't be looking for the return of Jesus. We'll be like, oh, that's way off. You know, we won't be looking for the imminent return of Jesus. And that's really important because if we're not doing that, then we're going to be focused on the earthly kingdom, not on God's kingdom, right? So anyway, I just wanted to go into that. Um, that is the reason why we are studying this, even though it's a lot of history. It's really important. And we can see that this, this final empire that is a revived Roman Empire will be um, the last world kingdom, and it is literally being set up. The stage is being set for it right in front of our eyes. So, so um, <clears throat> if you're, again, if you're struggling with understanding all of this, I want you to encourage you to go watch and rewatch the sessions, go through the notes, look at the scriptures. The more you do it, the more you will understand. And I get it, it's work. <laughs> This is work. It's going to be work. Um, it's easy to read through the, the easy parts of scripture, um, but it's hard to read through the difficult parts because you have to use your mind. You have to train your mind. You have to think. <laughs> and, um, but this is why we need the Lord's help, that the Holy Spirit helps us understand, and that's one of his roles is to give us understanding of scripture. So make sure you do that, okay? Okay, so let's get into Daniel chapter 9, and if you have your Bibles, you can open up to that chapter. Um, in Daniel chapter 8, we saw that uh, he had a dream about a ram and a goat. So Daniel chapter 9, the events that happen here is about 13 years after that, the dream about the uh, ram and the goat. And it, it was approximately 538 B.C., Daniel is visited by the angel Gabriel, who gives him even more information about what is going to happen in the end times. And at this point, he's an old man. He's probably in his 80s. He's been in Babylon for about 65 years. And um, when, as you, you will see as we start reading this chapter that Darius the Mede is now the king of Babylon. So again, I wanted to point this out because Daniel lived to see the fulfillment of this. Okay? because that's the, the, the Mede Persian Empire is the silver chest from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It is the uh, bear from Daniel's first dream, and it is the ram from chapter 8. So <clears throat> they all represent the Medo Empire, Medo Persian Empire that was conquered by Babylon. Okay, so let's start with Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. And I am reading from the NLT version. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, <laughs> who became king of the Babylons. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to the Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. I want to stop here for one quick second. Daniel said, I learned from reading the word of the Lord. Who would have thought? <laughs> Oh, we'll learn if we'll read from the word of God. Hmm. So this goes back to the point I made earlier, right? <laughs> Study it, you'll learn from it. Um, okay, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I, so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed O oh Lord, you are great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem, and all of Israel, scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us, because of our disloyalty to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the, but the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. 
We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of your sin, of our sin. You have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has there been such a disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord, God, the Lord our God was right to do all of these things, for we did not obey him. O Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. All the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of our ancestors. You are God, you are our God. Hear, oh sorry. You, O oh God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. For your own sake, do not delay. O oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. Okay, so... We can see here that Daniel has been reading the prophecies of Jeremiah and he knows that because of the sins of God's people, they are in exile for 70 years and he knows that the 70 years are almost up. So he starts to pray, confessing to the Lord his sins and the sins of all of Israel and reminding God of his promise to restore them. Moses did this too. <laughs> he would remind God of his promise and his covenant. Um, <clears throat> it says that he wore burlap and sprinkled himself in ashes. He is in anguish and he is sorrowful. So this is what repentance is, folks. <laughs> it is uh, not only recognizing your sins, but you will have sorrow and anguish over your sins and you will turn from them. Daniel acknowledges that the Lord brought disaster upon them because of those sins, and he even says that the Lord was right to bring this punishment on them. So that's quite a statement. <laughs> it shows humility and true repentance when you can say, I was wrong, I deserved this punishment from the Lord, right? Um, today, we kind of have a problem with that, don't we? <laughs> We have hardened hearts. We do not like to admit when we've done wrong. Um, and people sometimes say, and I hear this often actually, well, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, so that means we don't get any punishment. <laughs> and that is so far from the truth. <laughs> Yet, it, yes, he did pay the penalty for our sins, and um, but that does not get, mean that the consequences are taken away, right? So in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Galatians 6, verse 7, I believe we'll have it up there. It's just a little verse, but it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Right? So Daniel's statement that his people deserved being hauled off into captivity for the disobedience and idolatry shows that he is truly sorrowful and in anguish for his sins and the sins of his people, and it shows true repentance. He humbly asks the Lord to turn his fury away from Jerusalem and the people and to forgive them. And as Daniel is praying, the angel Gabriel receives a command to visit Daniel to give him a vision. So let's continue with verse 20. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. <clears throat> I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. 
As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning, the meaning of your vision. So I just want to stop here real quick. The moment Daniel began praying, a command was given uh, to Gabriel to go send a message to him. This just shows how prayers are so powerful, right? Especially the, the prayers of the righteous. <laughs> the prayers of the righteous are powerful and God hears them. So don't ever give up on praying and always remember that prayer is so powerful. So now we're going to get into the prophecy itself. Um, <clears throat> as we go through it, please keep in mind that there, are n there is no prophecy in all of scripture that is more critical to our understanding of the end times, these four verses. Um, this prophecy is known by many as the 70 weeks of Daniel. So we're gonna go through, I'm gonna read the whole thing, the whole, all four verses, and then we're gonna break it down. So if it is total, you know, jumbo blah, <laughs> to you, just remember, we're gonna, don't worry, we're gonna break it down. Okay. So let's start in um, verse 24, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. A period of 70 sets of seven, or other versions say 70 weeks, has been decreed for your people and, the holy, and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt, rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this, six period, or this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. <sighs> okay, <laughs> so this might be completely confusing, <laughs> but we're going to break it down. We're going to do verse by verse, and I will do my best to explain this to you as clear as possible. Um, so... Before, actually, before we start getting into the verses, I want to, we have to have an understanding of what the 70 sets of seven means or the 70 weeks mean. Um, <clears throat> it says, a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed on your people or your, and your holy city. And in other versions, again, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon your people and your holy city. So what does this 70 weeks mean? The Hebrew word translated weeks or sevens, refers to a period of seven years. So this is kind of like how our word decade refers to a period of 10 years. Um, it literally means a week of years. Um, so this means that each week is actually a period of seven years. So we have 70 weeks. Each of those 70 weeks are seven years. 70 times 7 is 490. So this is a total of 490 years. Are you following me? No? Nope. <laughs> well, we'll keep going through. Um, so I know this is a bit confusing. I, it, it took me a long time to wrap my brain around this, years actually. So don't feel bad if this is the first time you're studying this and you're like 70 sets of slow, what? Um, it will take some time. but. Um, in simple terms, it means that 
a total of 490 years have been determined on God's people, the Jews, and his holy city, Jerusalem. Now, as we go further into these four verses in Daniel, we will see that this period of 70 weeks, or 490 years, is divided into three parts. And I believe they're up there on the screen for you. Part one is a period of seven weeks, or 49 years. Seven times seven is 49. Part two is a period of 62 weeks, or 434 years. 62 times seven is 434. And then the last part is one week or seven years, okay? So it will make more sense to you as we go on. Um, but in simple terms, it's just saying, a, you know, just what I said. Part one is a 49 years, part two is 434 years, and part three is seven years. And this gives us a total of 490 years. Okay, so let's read verse 24, and we'll start breaking this down. Um, a period of 70 sets of seven, of, and again, other versions say 70 weeks, has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. So this is saying that six things would be accomplished for Daniel's people and Jerusalem um, over a total of 490 years. The six things that will be accomplished are, uh, number one, transgression will be finished. The Hebrew word for transgression is rebellion against God. So this means that Israel's rebellion against God will come to an end. Number two, to put an end to sin. Uh, there will be no more struggling with sin. This is pointing to a redeemed world and will happen when Jesus comes back to make all things new. Number three, to atone for wickedness. Sorry, some of these, I'm just realizing now that they're not exactly described as it was in that translation that I gave you, but basically this, it's the same thing. To atone for wickedness. Um, and this was clearly accomplished by Jesus on the cross in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for your sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So this is atonement for wickedness. This was fulfilled on the cross. Uh, number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This will be accomplished when Jesus sets up his kingdom here on earth and he will bring in a kingdom of everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up vision and prophecy. This means there's going to be an end and a fulfillment of all prophecy at that point. Um, number six, to anoint the most holy. So this one, there's actually a couple differing opinions to what this means. Um, is it referring to a person or is it referring to a place? So the most holy in the Old Testament was uh, many times referred to the temple or to the area that where the Ark of the Covenant was, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place um, where God dwelled. And many scholars believe that this is referring to when the third temple will be rebuilt and anointed. Others believe that this is referring to the Messiah, that he was anointed as the most holy at his baptism. So I'm not here to argue which one that is tonight, to be honest, I don't really know. I, I think both have a good argument. Um, but either way, this will happen at some point during the 490 years, okay? So all of these things, these six things, will be accomplished for Israel and the Jews over a total of 490 years. Let's continue with verse 25. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt, it meaning the holy city Jerusalem, will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. I actually am quoting the New King James Version here because it says Messiah the Prince, which is actually one of the only times that Jesus is referred to as Messiah in the Bible. And so I thought that was really important to point out. Um, do you remember when I mentioned that the 70 weeks or the 490 years would be divided into three parts? 
Here is, uh, in this one verse, we see the first and second part of the 70 weeks prophecy. The first part is a period of seven weeks, and the second part is a period of 62 weeks. And put together, these first two parts equal 69 weeks. So this verse is telling us what will happen during 69 out of the 70 weeks of (laughs) Daniel. So that's a lot happening in one little verse. (laughs) Um, And remember, each week actually represents seven years. So the seven weeks is 49 years. The 62 weeks is 434 years. And this totals 483 years. Okay, are you understanding so far? Kind of. (laughs) Um, This is really significant because the 70 weeks uh, represent 490 years. So this is literally telling us what is happening for 483 of those years. It's very important. So let's read it again. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So I I apologize if I repeat myself a lot, but repetition is always good. I believe in repetition. It helps us remember, but it also helps us understand the more we hear it. Um, This is a clear prophecy of the time of the first coming of Jesus. It is telling us that from the beginning, or from the time of the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus the Messiah comes, it will be 483 years. So... Now we need to find out when was the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem issued. So this is not the same decree that was given by King Cyrus of Persia when he, um, after the 70-year exile in Babylon, he gave the decree that the Jews could return back to their land. This is not the same thing. They were able to return back to their land. They were, they were able to rebuild their temple. Um, but this particular decree is talking about when they could rebuild Jerusalem and the wall. So this happened in Nehemiah chapter 2, and it didn't happen till 90 years after they had returned back after the 70-year exile. So let's just quickly recap. The last session we learned that the Jews and Daniel were hauled off into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar, And a while later, Persia conquered Babylon, and King Cyrus gave that decree that they could return and rebuild their temple. But not all the Jews returned at the same time. There were actually three different returns uh, after that. And some of them didn't return till years later. Hence Esther, the story of Esther, and Nehemiah, etc. So, yeah, so Nehemiah was still not in Israel at the time when this decree was given. And we need to also remember that though the Jews were allowed to be in their land, they weren't in control, in full control of their land, right? So that's really important to remember as we go through through this as well. Um, Okay, so let's read the decree that officially started the 70 weeks of Daniel. So if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 1. And I'm reading from the New King James Version here. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, (laughs) when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since uh, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid, and I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, and the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set, a, I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, 
the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So King Artaxerxes, who was, uh, he is still part of the Persian Empire, the Persian Empire is still ruling at this time, he gave Nehemiah the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And this happened in 444 BC. Um, so let's look at verse 25 one more time of Daniel 9. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes, there will be seven weeks, or 49 years, and 62 weeks, 434 years. Again, this is a total of 483 years. Now, this is really exciting. If you count 483 years from 444 BC, which is when the decree was uh, given to rebuild Jerusalem, on our calendar we get 40 AD. Now, in Luke chapter 3, it tells us that Jesus was around 30 years old when he started his ministry. And he would have been around or close to 33 when he died on the cross. And it is believed that Jesus was born somewhere right between 4 BC and 1 AD. So the timing is kind of off. So does this mean that the prophecy in Daniel is wrong? No. <laughs> no. Um, because both the ancient Hebrews and the ancient Babylons, Babylonians used a 360-day calendar not 365 days like we use today. So um, the 483 years given in this prophecy is based on their ancient calendar. On our calendar system, it is 476 years. Are you following me? <laughs> so this is really important, so pay attention. It's absolutely amazing. I get so excited every time I go through these things. Um, if you count 476 years based on our calendar, or 483 based on their calendar, from the year 444 BC, which was when the decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem, we come to 33 AD, which is the time that Jesus, they believe it was the year that Jesus would have been crucified. So, are you seeing the significance of this? <laughs> Um, Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 was fulfilled exactly as it was prophesied. Exactly 483 Jewish calendar years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given to Nehemiah. Jesus was approximately 30 to 33 years old, uh, which was the timing of when he presented himself as the Messiah. So this is very significant. Some scholars believe that this was fulfilled to the exact day when the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the shouts of Hosanna in the highest. The people honored him and laid down palm branches on the ground as he went by. But before that had happened, Jesus resisted uh, public identification as the Messiah. But from that day on, he embraced the title, right? And then another interesting fact is that this happened only seven days before his crucifixion. So keep that in mind as we read the prophecy again. So this is so crucial to understanding a prophecy about Jesus' first coming. Um, so let's read it again. No one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince comes. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it, the holy city, Jerusalem, will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Our God is so amazing. Um, so some of you might be wondering why the seven weeks and the 62 weeks are split up. What's the purpose of these two periods, especially when we know they total 483 years? Um, we know, here's what we do know. We know that they total 69 weeks out of the 70 weeks of Daniel. We know that the seven weeks represents 49 years and the 62 weeks represent 434 years, right? 
And we know that put together, they represent 483 years of the Jewish calendar. But why is it broken up into two periods? So let's look at the first period. This, the first period of seven weeks or 49 years is mentioned first. And we find the key to this in the last part of verse 25 of Daniel 9, where it says, it, the holy city Jerusalem, will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And in the New King James Version, it says, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. So this is referring to the amount of time it took for Nehemiah to complete uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. It only took 52 days for him to finish the wall, and that in itself is an incredible story. Go read it. <laughs> Um, literally, they were, there were men working on the clock 24 hours a day, it, and he had different, different people uh, in charge of different sections of the wall. It's absolutely amazing. Um, but in total, it wasn't until 395 BC that the rest of Jerusalem was restored as well. So this was exactly 49 years after King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah permission to return to Jerusalem and rebuild it in 444 BC. Okay, so when it says it will be rebuilt in times of trouble, this is referring to the opposition that Nehemiah faced when he was rebuilding it. There were a lot of people that did not want to see Jerusalem rebuilt. And you can actually read about all of this in the book of Nehemiah. So do that when you can, because it's really interesting. So that's the first section, the seven weeks or 49 years. Now, the second time period of 62 weeks, which is 434 years, refers to a period called the silent period. And it is a period after the ministries of Nehemiah and other Old Testament prophets. Um, during this time, uh, no books of the Bible were written. And actually, it's believed that Nehemiah is the very last book written in the Old Testament. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean that it was the last event that happened, but it's believed that it was the last book written. And we're going through the, the books of the Bible chronologically right now, um, but uh, that's according to the events that happened. So this is, ta I'm talking about here is the last book that was written is what they believe. So this period of 62 weeks or 434 years is referring to a period of silence where God didn't speak and no books of the Bible were written. And we don't really know much about this period of time other than what history tells us. Um, and we know that the Jews were still not in control of their land at this time. The Greeks, and we know from history, the Greeks were conquered, or the Gre Greeks conquered the Persians. And then after that, Rome conquered the Greeks. And Israel was under the control of Rome when Jesus came on the scene. So, so those are, that's kind of the background to that. And those are the two first parts of the 70 weeks of Daniel, of the Daniel prophecy. Um, and we will see the third part in verse 27. But first, um, let's read verse 26 because we're given a few more details about what happens after, like right after the second part. So let's read. Daniel 9, uh, verse 26. After this period of 62 sets of seven, or 62 weeks, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with the flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. So this part of scripture is telling us that the anointed one, who is Jesus, the Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing for a period of 62 weeks. So remember, we just learned that the, 70, or the seven weeks and the 62 weeks are actually 483 years on the Jewish calendar. So what this verse is saying is that after the 483-year period, um, when Jesus presents himself as Messiah to the Jews, he will be cut off and have nothing. This phrase, cut off and have nothing, refers to when Jesus was killed and crucified on the cross. 
he would have nothing, meaning he would be given no honor or glory that he deserved as their king and Messiah. This period of 62 weeks ended when Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, and this is when he rode in to Jerusalem on the donkey. But remember when I said Jesus was crucified only seven days after that event? So when it says, after this period of 62 weeks, the anointed one will be killed, when it says that phrase in that portion of scripture, this literally happened seven days after the end of the 62 weeks, or the 434 year period ended. So isn't that fascinating? Like <laughs> it all lines up exactly how it is given in the prophecy. So let's uh, go to the next part of verse 26, where it says, a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. In the New King James Version, this is really important to note the difference between these two versions of this portion. In the New King James Version, it says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So these two translations actually seem to differ quite a bit. Um, in the NLT, or the New Living Translation, is basically saying that a ruler will arise and his army will destroy the city. That's kind of what you're getting from that, right? But in the New King James Version, it says that the people of a future ruler to come will destroy the city. So this is one of those cases where it's really good to be looking at different translations and try to find out what the original uh, Hebrew or the original language that was written in meant and go back to the closest version of that because um, you can get a very different translation, right? So what does this mean? Well, we know that about 35 years after Jesus' crucifixion uh, in 70 AD, to be exact, the city of Jerusalem and its temple were once again destroyed. Who destroyed it? It was the Romans, led by Titus, who eventually became the emperor of Rome for a short period of time. So during that time, many Jews were killed, and surviving Jews were forced to flee for their lives, and many of them were captured and sold as slaves, scattering them across the nations. So when it says the people of the ruler who will come, this is referring to the Romans because it was the Romans that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, right? But who is this ruler? <clears throat> so some would say that it was Titus because he was the ruler that led the Romans to do this. And that would make sense if you go th with the NLT version. <laughs> but if you look at the New King James translation and it says the people of a ruler to come, it is talking about a future ruler. So what this means is that this ruler will come out of the same people or same empire as the people who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Are you following me? So, knowing this, we can determine that this ruler is the Antichrist because he will come out of the revised Roman Empire, hence the phrase, the people of the ruler to come, right? And you might say, well, how do you know this for sure? Well, we will see that in a few minutes in the, in the next verse, or one of, yeah, in verse 27. But um, before we get into that, I just want to go over the last part of verse 26. It says, The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. So, in the following 2,000 years after Jerusalem was destroyed um, in 70 A.D., I don't think a single Jewish generation has escaped involvement in a war of some kind. And this will continue until Jesus comes back. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's get, uh, get to the last verse of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, verse 27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven but after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. In the New King James Version, it says, 
He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is, uh, that is decreed is poured out on him. So in this verse, we are seeing the final third period of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Do you mind putting up that, that, uh, that one slide there? So we had the first period, which was the seven weeks. I, sorry, I'm repeating myself, but I really want you guys to get this, okay? So the first period was seven weeks, or 49 years, and that was the time when Nehemiah rebuilt Jerusalem. The second period was 62 weeks, or 434 years, and that was the si time of silence when no books of the Bible were written. Um, and everything that was prophesied to happen during those first two periods or which totaled 69 weeks out of the 70 weeks of Daniel, what, um, have come to pass. All of those things have come to pass. So here in verse 27, we have jumped to the last part, the final week of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And this week represents a period of seven years. So this is really important. Something really strange happens here. We literally just saw in verse 26, the prophecies of Jesus' death and resurrection, um, the, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and th both of those events were fulfilled. But here in verse 27, it jumps to a prophecy of the future ruler to come that was just mentioned in verse 26. And we found out that that ruler is the Antichrist. And we know this because in Revelation, it talks about the abomination of desolation, um, this same event that's going to happen in the in, during the tribulation in the book of Revelation. And it's also mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but it literally jumps from the destruction of Jerusalem, literally finishes off with that in verse 26, and then it jumps to this period. And we know, I'm sure many of you can figure it out, this period is the seven-year tribulation. <laughs> And we know this because the Bible tells us that at the end of the tribulation, Jesus will come back and make all things new. And this is when all six things that were mentioned in, the, in verse 24, the beginning of this prophecy, um, that is when all those things will be accomplished, right? So this is very significant because this means that there is a huge gap between week 69 and week 70 in the... In the um, the 70, prof 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. So the 70th week has not been fulfilled yet. Um, now, I, this has been something that I have gone back and forth on for years. What is the cause of this gap? Why, like, we're currently in this gap. <laughs> um, and there have been many different ex explanations. Um, we know that this is God's time clock. And... Uh, some scholars have hinted that whenever Israel has not been in the land, the time clock stops. But that didn't really make sense to me because the climb clock was clearly going when they were in Babylon, right? So <laughs> I, I, God literally just gave this to me recently. And when I, when I figured it out, I was so excited. <laughs> um, in the New Testament, there are scriptures that hint that while God is dealing with the church time ceases to exist for Israel, in a sense. So let's t turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 14 to 18. Acts chapter 15, verse 14 to 18. It says, Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. That is meaning the church, right? And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what, is prophes what the prophets predicted. As it is written, Afterwards, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who has made these, made these things known so long ago. So do you remember a couple sessions ago when I told you that during the different parts of the timeline, God's focus shifts? And do you remember when um, 
we talked about the present part of the time or the past part of the timeline god's focus is on israel right um and this uh and then on the present part of the timeline his focus switches to the church the present part is what we're in now and it is also called the church age and god's focus is on the church and this was because the Jews did not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. They were blinded to this. God blinded them to this on purpose. Why? So that the Gentiles could have a day of salvation, right? So God's focus is on the church during this present age or this church age. And then when the church is raptured and out of the way, God's focus shifts back to Israel again during the tribulation. So this is very important, and I want you to pay close attention. I'm so excited about this. Because the focus on the whole book of Daniel is on Israel, right? And because God's focus shifted to the church during the church age, which, is, which started exactly when the second period of 62 weeks ended, by the way. Um, where was I? started exactly when the second period of 62 two weeks ended with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That is why there is a gap between the 69 and 70 weeks of Daniel. The gap is the church age. Isn't this amazing? This is so amazing. <laughs> because the first two parts, it's, it goes one right into the other. There's no breakups, there's no split. And then boom, all of a sudden we have like this 2,000 year period where clearly week seven, or the, the, the final week of the 70-week 70 prophe prophecy of Daniel has not happened yet. And so this has kept p prophecy scholars, you know, trying to figure this out for many years. But I was literally just recently, just the Lord, the Holy Spirit just downloaded it to me, and I'm like, yes, this is what it is. It's the gap. Because God's focus switched, and because his focus is on the church, the time clock for Israel stopped during this time. Okay, so are you understanding this? And then when, God, when uh, the church is removed with the rapture, God's focus will, f will go back to Israel and the time clock, time clock starts again. So that final week of Daniel, will, will go, will, the time clock will start again. So this will be the final part, the final week or the seven years of God's plan for Israel. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of that and there's a gap. Let's move on uh, to verse 27. It says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Did I read verse 27 already? Okay, so we're just going to break down verse 27 now. Sorry. Okay, so it says, He will confirm a covenant with uh, many for one week. Well, who is he? Um, this is the same ruler that is mentioned in verse 26. Remember when I said, I will prove to you that this is the Antichrist. <laughs> it says right here, because we know that it is the Antichrist that will make a peace treaty with Israel. Um, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is a seven-year period, and this will most likely be the seven-year peace treaty with Israel that permits them to build a temple and reinstate their old covenant worship system. And then it says, in the middle of the week, or in the middle of the seven-year treaty, he will break the covenant, and he will violate this treaty by putting an end to sacrifices and offerings. Not only will he do that, but he will also set up an abomination in the temple. And this will be something that the Jews will consider a desecration of their temple. And he will declare himself God. And this will go on until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So this is referring to when Jesus comes back and defeats the Antichrist and throws him and his false prophet into the lake of fire. Can't wait for that day. Um, so now I mentioned in the last session that some people say that this prophecy was fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes in 175 BC. And we saw that that was not the case. It was very clear that that was not the case. And again, if you weren't here last session, go back and watch that. Um, but there are also some people that believe that this was fulfilled in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. 
And again, this is not the case because Jesus tells us that this event will happen at the end of the age, shortly become his sec before his second coming. And when we go through Revelation, we'll see that clearer as well. So, now that we have gone through each of the four verses of this prophecy, I want to read all four verses again, one more time, and hopefully it will make more sense to you now, okay? <laughs> so, Let's read Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed on your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood, and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but after his, half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So are the puzzle pieces starting to fit it together a little bit better now? I hope so. I hope, it, I hope it's helping a bit. But again, if this is confusing, go back, go read it over. Eventually, the dots will start connecting, okay? So... What time are we at? Okay, so let's move on to uh, Daniel chapters 10, 11, and 12. So in these chapters, Daniel is given a vision with more very specific details about what was to come. The vision and its interpretation goes over the whole three chapters. So um, it's not like each chapter is a different vision. So... For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through every single part of all three of these chapters, but we will go through the main important points, okay? Um, in chapter 10, Daniel tells us of a revelation he received concerning a great war that was coming and times of hardship. This was given to him about a year after his vision of the 70 weeks. And then in chapters 11 and 12, we are giving, given the details of this vision. Um, and actually, most of chapter 11 gives us more very specific details about the Persian and Greek empires. And uh, we can see when looking back at history, they were fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So again, because we're short on time, I'm not going to go through those. We've already gone through some of the other prophecies that d gave details about these empires. But I have done a full study on these chapters. And if you are interested, I will send them to you. Okay? So just let me know. Um, so for tonight, I'm going to focus on the prophecy starting in verse 36 of chapter 11. And here again, we are shifting from history to future prophecy, okay? And this is actually shifting to the middle of Daniel's 70th week, which is the start of the Great Tribulation. Um, so speaking, it talks about a king, and this king mentioned here is the Antichrist, just so you all are aware, okay? So starting verse 36 of Daniel chapter 11. The king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or for the god loved by women or for any other god, for he will boast that he is greater than them all. Instead of these, he will worship the god of fortresses, a god his ancestors never knew, and lavish on him gold, silver, precious stones, and expensive gifts. Claiming this foreign god's help, he will attack the strongest fortresses. He will honor those who submit to him, 
appointing them to positions of authority and dividing the land among them as their reward. So again, in these verses, we're given more details about the Antichrist. And this passage is actually very similar to 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. So these verses are very parallel, and they're both talking about the Antichrist. And we're going to go more into a fuller discussion about the Antichrist when we get into the book of Revelation. Um, but tonight we're going to discuss the details given to us in this portion of scripture. So, in verse 37, it says that the Antichrist will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors, or for the god loved by women, or for any god, for he will boast that he is greater than them all. Um, now, many scholars have debated what this means, and some translations say he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, which has led many to believe that the Antichrist will be homosexual. Um, however, if you look at this portion of scripture in its entirety, in, in the context of what it's supposed to be, be, I believe that this means something different. In the NIV, it says he will have no regard for the one desired by women. So this whole portion of scripture is talking about the Antichrist's disregard for other gods, right? It's not talking about his sexual orientation. <laughs> and it says that the Antichrist will exalt himself above other gods. He will have no regard for uh, any god, especially the god of his ancestors. And he will have no regard for the one desired by women. And then in verse 38, it goes on to talk about gods again. So... Um, it says, in verse 38, it says, instead of these, meaning he was speaking about gods the whole time, he will worship the god of fortresses, a god of his ancestors, his ancestors never knew. So we can see that this whole context, the whole context of this portion of scripture is about gods and the Antichrist's lack or regard for gods. It is not about his sexual orientation. So this brings us to who then is the one desired by women. And what is this referring to? So this is very important, so pay attention. Historically, uh, it was the desire of every Hebrew woman to be the mother of the Messiah. And so many scholars believe, and I actually agree with them, that the one who is desired by women is referring to Jesus, the Messiah, who is God the Son, right? Um, so it's not talking about the Antichrist's sexual desire. And I'm not saying the Antichrist isn't going to be homosexual. I don't know. I just believe that this portion of scripture isn't specifically referring to that. Okay? He will have no regard for Jesus, who is God the Son, or God the Father. Now, this scripture could also mean, hear me out, <laughs> that Jesus, or not Jesus, that the Antichrist might be Jewish. And... Uh, or at least appear to be Jewish. So why would I say that? Well, it specifically mentions that he will have no regard for the God of his ancestors. If he was Jewish, then this would mean that he would have no regard for, for the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, the God of the Bible. Uh, but it also says that he will have no regard for any God so I can't be 100% sure on that translation, okay? I just, this is just, I think this is definitely a possibility. Um, it would make sense to me because the Jewish people would easily accept a Jew or trust a Jew leader that would want to sign a peace treaty with them, wouldn't they? Um, if he was Muslim or any other person than a Jew, I find it really hard to believe that they would easily trust someone. Um, and when, what does it mean when it says that he will worship a god of fortresses, a god his ancestors never knew? A god of fortresses could be referring to uh, power or force or military might. Um, but we know that the Antichrist will exalt himself above all gods. So I believe that this foreign god he worships will be Satan himself. Uh, because it is Satan that will give him his power. And Satan will enter the Antichrist and he will force the world to worship him as God. Remember he said, said he had no regard for other gods. So 
Satan is the dragon. We'll talk about him in Revelation. And he is the one who gives the Antichrist his power. And so that's why I believe that that's what that is talking about. Okay. Um, we saw that in previous chapters in Daniel that the Antichrist will come out of a revived Roman Empire. So this does not necessarily mean that he is Italian or Roman. Uh, it means he will come out of the revised Roman Empire and will set up his world order. So this, interestingly enough, <laughs> this one world order is being pushed by elitists like the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, who, by the way, are part of the Illuminati, which is a secret organization that was founded in 1776, made up of a group of people that believe they have special enlightenment or knowledge and they believe that Lucifer is the light bearer. So they worship Satan, literally. Um, their bloodlines or family lines go back hundreds of years. And many of these people are Jewish, or I should say they call themselves Jews. <laughs> but I really highly question if they actually are. Um, in Revelation, it talks about those who call themselves Jews, but are actually from the syn synagogue of Satan. So I believe that that is exactly what that verse is talking about. Um, but I may be wrong. <laughs> so I got way off track here, but I wanted to mention that. So let's get back to Daniel 11, and we're going to read starting verse 45. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. So here we see that the king of the north and the king of the south will come against the Antichrist. Um, who are these kings? Well, some say that Russia will be the king of the north. Um, but I believe it will more likely be the remnants of the Seleucid and uh, Ptolemyak uh, empires that will attempt to reassert their historic dominance over the Middle East. And if you remember from the last session, we talked about those empires. Those were the four horns that grew up. Remember, Alexander the Great was the big horn, and he got, it got smashed off, and he died suddenly. And so four empires, which were led by four of Alexander's generals sprang up out of that. And these are two of those empires that I'm talking about right now. So the Antichrist will defeat them. I, and I can't, I don't know exactly who they are going to be. It's just my thoughts going here. Um, the Antichrist will defeat them and then he will move his headquarters to Israel, exercising control from there. And we know that the verse he will pitch his royal tents between seas at the beautiful holy mountain is referring to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is frequently referred to as the holy mountain in many scriptures. So um, the prophecies in chapter 11 continue on to chapter 12. So let's start with verse 1. This is going to be very quick, but I wanted, this is, there's a couple of really important things I want to mention here. Um, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. So I find this portion of scripture very interesting. <laughs> so let's break it down. 
um, verse 1. When it says at that time, what is it speaking about? It is a continuation from chapter 11. So this is talking about the tribulation. Um, and who is Michael, the great prince who protects your people? What does the Bible say about Michael? It says in Jude chapter 9 that he's an archangel. Actually, he's the only angel that is officially called an archangel in the Bible. Um, archangel means chief messenger or chief angel. In Daniel 10, he's called the chief prince. In Daniel 12, he's called the great prince. Um, and we saw here that it says the great prince who protects your people. So this is why it is considered by many that uh, Michael is the protector of Israel, officially protector of Israel. And most of the time when you see him appear in the Bible, it has something to do with Israel. Uh, now, what does it mean when it says Michael will arise? There are some who believe this verse means that Michael is the restrainer spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. And we will go more into the restrainer in the future, but I really believe this is important to mention because this is the verse, specific verse that is bringing up uh, these beliefs. And so I want to address this. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, it says, And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So this is saying here that the restrainer is the only thing that is holding back lawlessness, <laughs> which we know from many other scriptures, it, the lawless one is the Antichrist, right? So some people believe the restrainer is the Archangel, Archangel Michael, and that this verse in Daniel 12 verse 1 that says he will arise means that Michael will be removed from protecting Israel at that time and that the Antichrist will be revealed. Now, I struggle with this theory for a few reasons. Number one, we know that Michael is Israel's protector and even though the Antichrist will make war against Israel during the mid-half of the tribulation, he will not succeed in wiping them out. Israel will be supernaturally protected in the desert during that time. And it is right around that same time, and we'll see this in Revelation, that a war happens in the heavens between Michael and Satan, and Satan is cast down to earth. And um, when we go through that time, it is right around the same time when the Antichrist sets up his abomination of desolation in the temple um, and then starts to pursue the Jews and go after them. But then God supernaturally protects them in the desert for three and a half years. So I believe that this war in the heavens is actually referring to that. And Michael um, is involved in this war. And Michael is the protector of Israel, meaning he will arise once again to fight for the nation of Israel. Are you seeing this? So in your own time, if you have time, go compare Daniel 12 verse 1 with Matthew 24, verses 15 to 16, and verses 21 to 22, and then compare those with Revelation chapter 12, verse six to eight. Now, do you need me to repeat that? <laughs> okay, go and compare this chapter, or this verse, Daniel chapter 12, verse one, and compare it with Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 16, and verses 21 to 22. Did you get that? Okay. And then compare that with Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Got it? Okay. So you will see as you go and compare those verses, and I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not going to do it tonight because we are, we do not have time. I got to hurry up and finish, but Michael doesn't stand aside at all. He is fighting against the dragon. Um, so this makes little sense to me that Michael will stop defending the people of Israel when the context is that Israel will be saved through the tribulation. You following me? Okay, really quickly, two more points. Uh, secondly, while Michael is Israel's protector, he is never assigned to the role of restraining lawlessness in general. 
It says in scripture that the restrainer is the one who is restraining or holding back the lawless one. So even though Michael is very powerful, um, I don't know if he's powerful enough to restrain all evil and the lawless and lawlessness. Um, so the Holy Spirit has that power though. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, he who is in you, meaning the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world, meaning Satan. The Holy Spirit lives inside those who are his true followers, the church. So he is the only one, in my humble opinion, that has the power to restrain evil and lawlessness all over the world. And we'll get more into all of, you know, the who the restrainer is again. I, I mean, I'm sure you guys have put two and two in together and you, you know that I believe it's the, whole, the Holy Spirit. But um, when he is removed, Satan will officially be free to set up his antichrist and one world system at that point. And all hell will break loose. I mean, we think things are bad now. When the Holy Spirit is removed, the church is removed, the prayers of the saints are removed, that all hell will break loose. Um, number three, another reason that I have a hard time believing that Michael is the restrainer is because Michael is not omnipresent, right? This means he could not physically constrain evil all over the world at the same time, right? So, but, but we know that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, so he can restrain law lawlessness over the whole earth at the same time. Is this making sense to you? Now, the reason I am going into so much detail about this <laughs> is because there are many beliefs that this verse in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, means that Michael is the restrainer. And I am here to prove to you that no, that is not the case. <laughs> okay? Okay. So, um, the if the phrase, he will arise, does not mean that Michael is the restrainer, what does it mean? I believe that Michael, whose main job it is to protect Israel, will rise up once again at that time and directly fight Satan during the tribulation to protect Israel from the Antichrist who will viciously attack. Okay? Uh, verse 2. It says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. I am going to go through this really fast. Um, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who le lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So what does this mean when it says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake? This is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And sometimes the Bible uses the phrase, those who are asleep or sometimes it even uses the, the, the word rest, they're resting, um, it, re it is referring to the dead. Um, but we know that they're not permanently dead, right? <laughs> Their bodies will be resurrected to life. Some will be resurrected to everlasting life, which means eternity with God, and others will be resurrected to shame and everlasting contempt, which is eternity in hell. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we will talk more about the resurrection of the dead, okay? Um, in verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. So Daniel's told to seal up the words of this vision until the end days. But in Revelation, John is told the exact opposite. He's told to not seal up the words that he is given. So, I believe that this means that only those in the end days will have the ability to understand these prophecies. And the last days started about 2,000 years ago, right? Remember we were talking about that previously? And so I believe this ability has been given to Christians since that time. When it says many will go here and there to increase knowledge, I believe that this is describing what it will be like in the last days. And we can see what this means just by looking around today, right? <laughs> um, we're definitely going to and fro, running around like chickens with our heads cut off, super busy. Um, we can order anything we want online just by a click of a button and it can get to us sometimes the same day, if not within a day or two. Uh, we can hop on a plane and fly to the end of the other side of the world for, like, in a matter of hours. Knowledge has increased in these last days. So 
if you really think about it, for 6,000 years, there were no cars, there were no planes, no computers, no phones. It wasn't until the last 100 or so-ish years that all of those things were invented, right? So the fact that we can see what is going on on the other side of the world on live vision, or live television, helps us understand how the world will be able to see the end times events unfold in real time as they happen. So before tele television and radio were invented, I, I think a lot of Christians were wondering how that would happen. <laughs> but now we can see, right? We can see how this could, be, could happen. And you know, we receive information within seconds of it happening nowadays. Um, so let's continue in uh, verse 5, or 12, chapter 12, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times, and a half a time. When the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 12 or 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Okay, so uh, one of the two angels that are standing on either side of the river asks the angel uh, who was giving the prophecy how long it would be before all the prophecy would be fulfilled. And he responds, a time, a times, and half a time. Now, what does this mean? There has been some debate over this, but many scholars believe that these times represent years. So a time represents one year. Times, which is plural, represents two years. And a half a time represents a half a year. Are you getting this? That's a total of three and a half years. So this time period lines up with the time spoken in Revelation, the Great Tribulation, right? Which is the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. Um, the Great Tribulation will begin when the Antichrist breaks the covenant he has made and commits the abomination of de desolation, which we saw in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And the Israelites will hide in the wilderness, miraculously protected by God, and the Antichrist will be, vict uh, will be victorious over the saints for a period of time, anyway. And this is what is referred to here as shattering of the power of the holy people. So that is what that means, is that the Antichrist, it will seem, he will have victory over them for a period of time. All pride will be erased from Jews during this time. The Lord will soften their hearts and they will come to a point of humility knowing that the Lord who has protected and preserved, it is the Lord who has protected and preserved them. Um, Daniel heard what was said, but he had a hard time understanding it, which I don't blame him. <laughs> um, if the power of the Jews was shattered, was this the end of the Jews? Uh, had the angel given him all these details only to end the prophecy with his people being destroyed? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? Um, but he didn't know what we now know. <laughs> um, so he asked the angel what the outcome of all this will be, but his questions were not answered. He was told to go his way and that the words were sealed and concealed until the end of the age. The angel told him that none of the wicked would ever understand it, but only those who are wise would figure it out. Well, who gives us wisdom? The Holy Spirit. And when was the Holy Spirit given to us? The day of Pentecost, right? Um, so like I mentioned before, 
I believe that God gave true Christians the ability to understand these prophecies since that time, since, the day, since we were given the Holy Spirit. And we know that we will never fully understand everything, but we can definitely understand some things, right? Whatever it is the will of the Lord for us to know. Now, in verse 11 and 12, where it's talking about the 1290 days and the 1335 days, I have read dozens of interpretations of this and none of them persuade me, <laughs> to be honest. So um, some of them use the year for a day concept, others add the 1290 and the 1335 together, um, and still others ins insert the Hebrew 13th month to somehow explain you know, the difference between that time period. I mean, the, it is very clear that, tw that the, the Great Tribulation will be 1260 days. So this additional 30 days, uh, I don't know what is going on there. So um, with all of those interpretations, they admit that it is pure speculation. So personally, I believe this is simply one of those um, those mysteries that God has just simply not revealed to us yet for whatever reason. And it could be that he keeps things from us um, so that it wouldn't alert the enemy prematurely. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But I'm not even going to try to go into what those numbers mean because <laughs> I honestly, I don't know. But we will know someday. <laughs> so the angel finishes off by saying, that Daniel will rest and then rise up and receive his allotted inheritance. And this means Daniel would live out the rest of his days, he would die, which is hence the rest, um, but not spiritually dead, of course, which is why, and then he will be raised up to meet Jesus in the clouds and receive his rewards. That is what that means. And this is our blessed hope, and it's coming soon. Okay, so that is all for tonight. I know it's a lot of information, but I really wanted to get through the book of Daniel tonight, so I'm sorry that it went so long. But um, again, we're going to go through questions now. If you need to leave, feel free to do that. Uh, I know it's been a long evening. And again, try to keep questions to tonight's session um, or even the last session because it was also on the book of Daniel. And speak into the mic so everybody can hear you. Okay? Yeah, thank you about the Holy Spirit. You talked about when God had the silence and Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, well, it's prophesied in Joel. I think it's Joel chapter 2. I'll pour out the man in white linen, I'll pour out his, the embers, which is the Holy Spirit. So I started thinking about, okay, um, when the church gets raptured, but on all flesh, so the church, the church gets raptured, but all, all men have the Spirit. But he's talking about the restrainer. I think the Holy Spirit will leave when the church is raptured. <laughs> yes, and we will be going through that in the, in the future sessions, but yes, that is exactly what I believe as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. <sorry. laughs> the seal was shut up and uh, don't, don't open it. <laughs> in Revelation when um, they cried because no one was worthy to open up the seal. And then... The angel came and said, oh, the, the lamb who was slain, he is worthy. Yes, Jesus is the only one that can open up the seal. Yeah, sorry, what, sorry, what was the question? That was the same, like the seal that was unable to be opened, just shut it and close it, and then just leave it, go your way, you'll die, you'll receive your inheritance. What a blessed promise. But the one in Revelation where... No, is it where they're open? Is that the same, same seal you think, or the, same like scroll? the seal of like the Holy Spirit? Are no. you talking about the restrainer? Is this have something to do with the no, restrainer, no. or what the, are you the saying? The seal, they say, seal up these words. Yeah. Nobody's at, at the end of chapter twelve. Yeah, and then in Revelation, oh when yeah, nobody can open it. Oh, the one who is slain, he's able to open it. Yeah, he, he is worthy. I mean, it, it's definitely possible that those are the same, the same things, but in Revelation. The seal that Jesus can open 
is the events of the judgments and it gives all of the details of the judgments and so I believe that the seals that he is opening in that part is actually the judgment that is coming on the earth at that point. Um, so the sealing up the words of the prophecy, um, I believe it's, I mean, just thinking about it right now off the top of my head, I believe that it's probably referring more to the understanding of prophecy. You know what I mean? That's just my own opinion. Anyway. Don't know if I answered that all right, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, is there a timeline for the seal being opened now? Are you talking about the seals that he was just talking about? Yes. The judgments? That he's opened up the seals and proclaimed the judgments already, like now, and then these, within these days? Um, like we're the 2020s? <laughs> we're going to get into that right away. Next week, we're starting the book of Revelation, so we're going to start getting into some of that. But I, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a little bit ahead of time, but. I don't believe we're, the seals have been opened yet, personally. And I'll give you the reasons why next week. <laughs> so you'll have yeah. to wait till next week. Mm -hmm. That's right. Stay tuned. <laughs> Be right back. Uh, one of the things that I was reading in a, a separate revelation study is that none of this will come to pass until the temple is rebuilt. Um, and I've seen a lot of things uh, been happening in Israel. Like there's, there's war. There's mm -hmm. people coming at them from the north, south, east, west, and red heifers are coming in. Like they have everything that mm -hmm. they need to mm -hmm. build the temple. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of when. Yes. When do you when, like, <laughs> like um, there there's a lot of things that still need to happen even before the temple is built, but they have everything they need. What, what is the next step, really, do you think? Um, well, I personally believe that the temple is, just like you said, everything is ready to go, and so they can rebuild that temple really fast. It's, it, you know, it depends how thoroughly they do it. If they do it like Solomon, well, that's a lot more elaborate because they had, you know, pillars of marble and all this stuff. Um, if they could even set up one temporarily kind of like the tabernacle was, we don't know how that's going to look. Either way, with the things we have today, pe things can be built much quicker. Um, I think it can happen very quickly. Now, I don't think that the, ta that the temple will be built until the peace treaty is signed with Israel. And the reason for that is because there is such a war going over the temp you know, about who owns the Temple Mount. And I talked about, I can't remember if I said this last week or the week before, but we were talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And the reason that th that is such a controversy is because if that was found and brought to light, which apparently, according to the Temple Institute, they know exactly where it is, which is the first time they've ever admitted that before, which is actually fascinating. Um, they, so they know where it is, but if that was brought out to light, that would cause even, I mean, you think there's unrest now in Israel? The, the, the Muslims do not want that to be brought to light because that would be proof that the Temple Mount belongs to the Jews. And so I don't know exactly how that's going to look. I don't know if the, the, you know, right now they're trying to get the, Jew, the Israel to give up portions of land and they have been for centuries and Palestine and all this kind of stuff where really historically that land belongs to them. But, um, and you know, I love the Muslims, but they have tons of countries, right? And yet everybody's fighting for this one tiny little piece of land. <laughs> and the Jews don't have any land to claim for their own except for that land. So why such a fight over this tiny little piece of land, which it's been, there's been wars happening over that little piece of land for centuries. So um, all that to say that I believe that until um, there's a peace treaty signed, that the Muslims have to stick to their terms and the Jews have to stick to their terms, there will not be a rebuilding of the temple. So I believe that that's actually gonna happen. I believe that the peace treaty will, treaty will be signed at the beginning of the tribulation and that the temple will be built immediately after that peace treaty is signed. 
Yes. Good question, good answer. <laughs> Daryl. I have a question. My question really isn't about tonight, oh. Pastor. It, uh, it was awesome. Okay. It's about next Thursday. Oh, okay. Isn't, are we not having our, our dinner Oh, next? yeah. Yeah, thank you for I bringing that up. I'm We're sorry. having, thank you so much. I was totally like my vision laser focused on all this um yeah we're having our remnant family potluck next week so we're gonna have a break and then the following week we will go into revelation <laughs> which gives so me a week to catch up because i have not finished this series yet <laughs> that gives all of you a chance to catch up that missed the, some of the other sessions yes yeah. yes all right uh one more question Rebecca? I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> uh, when it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn, of, uh, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Like, that's very hopeful. Like, that's what we're going to be. Um, yeah. But when it says in verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, or, or abhorrence is what the other word says. So what about people who are cremated? They're going to rise. They're, they're going to be, it doesn't matter if they're cremated or not. It's kind of like anybody that's ever been in a house fire or anybody that's ever died in anything like that. Their bodies will be resurrected one way or another. I don't know how that's going to look, but God knows. So, yeah, that's right. Adam was formed from the dust, she said. All right, maybe so. one more question. One more. From somebody that hasn't asked a question. <laughs> one more Crystal, <laughs> I knew there was one that somebody was burning. <laughs> the the one where it talks about the the God desired by women. Mm. I was reading in my Bible and it said something about like the God of fertility or yeah, the God of fertility is uh -huh. what that referred to. Mm -hmm. I mean it's possible, but I believe the more I've looked into it and the more I've studied it, I, I really believe it's referring to Jesus because the Jewish women all desired to give birth to the Messiah. So I believe that that is what that is talking about. And, um, you know, it didn't specifically mention any other gods in particular. It was talking about he had no regard for any gods at all except for himself as God. And so... Uh, in, in my way of thinking, I mean, and again, I could be wrong, so don't take my word as, you know, scripture, but I really believe that is pointing more to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus, God the Son, the one who was desired by women to give, they wanted to give birth. Not in a sex, they didn't desire him in a sexual way. <laughs> it, was a, it was they desired to give birth to him in that type of way, is what I believe. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Awesome. Wasn't that yeah. good, everybody? I think that's the best description I've ever heard on the book of Daniel. And uh, the, the easiest to understand. I thought it was very good. Uh, we'll pray and then we'll let you guys go tonight. But uh, Sunday, we're celebrating two years of the remnant. And so I'm so excited for that. So... Um, We'll have some testimonies, and then we'll have cake after the service. Uh, that Sarah and I will be hand, yeah, Sarah and I will be handing out cake at the end of the service. I'll be eating it while I'm handing it out, so it'll be great. But it's going to be awesome. So I'll I'll bless you. You guys are welcome to stay around and visit if you want for a bit. Uh, but I'll bless you, and then you can leave. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn His face to run towards you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Awesome. Well